checking yourself. Because as the emotion increases in intensity, you are more and more hooked into the story. Instantly think about, oh, wait a minute, which story is it? And then bring yourself back to the present. Because in the present is equanimity. It's that kind of center, inner peace type thing. And this is the observer position, if you like, in the present. It's the experiencer, you're the antenna, you're the receiver. Um, all of these things are happening in the present and everything's available to you. Hi, this is Amanda Gore and this is your superior self. Amanda, Hall of Fame speaker, thank you so much for taking the time. This is going to be a great conversation, part two. We had some technical difficulties <laughs> the first yeah. time, but I have a feeling this one's going to be more exhilarating, higher energy. Nothing's going to be able to touch this conversation. The one thing I did not hit on last conversation is how we came to know each other. And I really think that's important to give the listener some context. I know a channeler. Uh, in New Zealand, his name is Blair Styra, and he channels Tabash, uh, an entity of um, uh, a higher. I don't. I don't even know. I think he's an ancient being from you know way back in the day, and he comes in and gives really um, positive messages to people, and really um, dives into their unconscious uh, worlds and kind of brings up things that they don't see about themselves, and and gives them advice on how to proceed through life. And he kind of gave you a message, right, Amanda, like to reach out to me and connect. Yeah, he did. He specifically mentioned you. He was putting me in an uncomfortable position, really, because he was saying, yes, it was good I was in America because I've only just moved here a year ago now, and uh, that I needed to be bigger than big, more than more. You've heard Trey say that, uh, Tabash say that to you, I'm sure, hasn't he? Yeah. And uh, so he said, and you need to be out there, and, and there's a man called Trey Downs and and you would need to be on his show. He's a wonderful, famous podcaster. So mm. I'm very uh, grateful to you, Trey, because you were extremely gracious. I wrote, you didn't know me from Adam, and uh, I felt a bit odd saying, well, Tabash said we should get together. And lo and behold, here we are. So thank sure. you. Well, a, a couple of uh, things popped up. I think you sent me an email like earlier uh, last year and I didn't get it. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I get this uh, follow up from you. So thank you for following up. But Tabash has never introduced me to anyone really, or even like um, recommended a guest. So like you, I, I find that was a sign, uh, you know, like uh, there's something going on in synchronicity that I have to follow up on especially to Bosch, because I resonate so highly with his messages. Um, I, when I was going through a hard time at work, like really, uh, I would say dark night of the soul. Uh, I would listen to Del Dolores Cannon at night, each night when I was putting my baby girl to bed, her, um, her radio show and Blair came up and I started listening to him. This is way back. I don't, I don't years ago when he came on the show. And so like, I reached out to him and had a, um, a session with him and then, he came on the show twice and I truly resonated with his message. So when he, when Tabash says something, when, when Tabash calls, you answer, right? Like that, that's how I yeah. view it. So I, yeah. I'm really, I think it's going to be great to connect with you on the show and, and really promote your work. Um, you are a hall of fame speaker, but I find that like Blair, that we're all channeling from some part of ourselves. Now Tabash is what I come to understand as a separate entity than Blair, but I think that we can all connect with that higher part of ourselves. And I think you do that when you go out and speak publicly. You're absolutely right. For for me, anyway, uh, I started off speaking in, in uh, being mentored by a, a wonderful uh, professional speaker from the States who was living in Australia. So I would do normal preparation and I never even thought about channeling a million years ago when I started, like 35 years. And I, I worked very hard at the technical skills behind speaking and developing my stories and my nonverbals and my group dynamics. And I studied for 35 years with Michael Grinder, who's the world's leading authority on nonverbal communication. So he taught me how to do the, to manage group dynamics and 
manage my stage presence. So I learned the technical skills. And then when I was um, 62, I started working with a man called David Martin. And I've been working on myself forever. You know, I'm just a forever work on yourself person. Although Tabash did say to me, stop working on yourself and start working with yourself, which I thought was profound for me anyway. Um, and so I had been working with David and sorting out uh, understanding that I had created a persona for the stage, which was the antithesis of everything I'd ever wanted to do. And I had taken that persona in an attempt to be authentic and transposed it into my real life. So I was never happy. I was speaking about joy, but I was such a fraud because here I am, this person that had no clue who she was, but I had this persona that I had combined. And so now here I'm walking around as a persona. I was authentic at last, but to my persona, not to who I really am or my essence. So working with David, I... It was very painful, really, going through a whole lot of experiences. But I'm closer to being more authentic and more myself on stage. And as I've become more of that, I've realised I could... The first clue for me that I was channelling on stage was that I couldn't prepare properly, what I call properly, and in the way I usually did it, which which never took me very long, but I would always write things out and then I would sit at the back of the room and I would make extra notes and I, I would have a plan in mind for when I stood up. Well, now I can't. And I'm fortunately it's happened enough that I'm trusting it because the impact of when I'm in my essence and I'm channeling my higher nature, I guess, my uh, guides or I'm not quite sure what it is, but I do like, say a little prayer early on to say, make sure that it's only good that's coming through. And as Paul Selig does, you know, say a little prayer to to clear the anything negative. Um, but the impact that that has is so much greater than I ever had just as m me, Amanda, speaking. So me, the bigger Amanda, good old Tabash, has much more impact and and we were discussing before, and I think it's worth mentioning again, when you bring your, so Ralph Waldo Emerson, who you are, shout so loudly, I can't hear what you say. When you're on stage and you're in your essence, I I actually think at times you wouldn't even need to say words. Now, you'd have to say words because you'd look stupid standing on the stage just smiling at people for an hour. Um but it's really the essence that's integrating with the field of everybody else there that creates a unified field in which people can change. Hmm. And, and they seem to change at more profound levels without even knowing it. That's something I've noticed in the last two or three years since it, but particularly, I suppose, in the last six months or so. It's 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 amazing and fascinating. And sometimes I'm out, you know, I'm speaking and I have this nanosecond where I'm not in my body and I'm going, wow, that was really great. Gee, that's that was, wow, i got to remember that one. And then I'm back in again. Hmm. But often I don't remember anything from being on stage. So I'm, I'm not the, the usual sort of person that you have on, on the show, Trey, for which I'm very grateful again, because most of your the people you interview they've done this for a long time and and I'm kind of like the unconscious becoming more conscious channeler I suppose I will think we're all channeling essentially right or uh, I that's 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 how I feel um it seems like in your previous talks that I've watched you bring a lot of science into your um conversations right so when did you start becoming more open to the channeling parts of um, aspects of yourself and other channelers work? Like when did you start becoming more open like to Bosch, his teachings? Like was there a phase in your life that kind of opened you up to that? Uh, that's a great question. No, do you know, I think I've always been open and my number one value was learning. So I always wanted to be better than better. Well, you know, it ties back, Trey, to a lot that I speak about, which are the core unconscious fears that drive our lives. And as a toddler, I told myself, I got the trifecta, 
And again, this was channeled on stage, these three core fears. Uh, I've been talking about them forever, but I, I don't ever remember anyone giving me this content. And I've never heard anybody else package it this way. So the three core fears, which is really important for you to know with your daughter, because epigenetics shows us between the ages of zero and seven, we set in these foundational core beliefs. And with David's work, David Martin, I've realized that these are stories we tell ourselves. And if you can catch your child between zero to seven, you can make sure that those stories have less impact on the rest of their lives. So I'll give you the, the fears and then you'll understand how that drove me to keep growing. And I, wherever I could get a clairvoyant or someone like that, I, I would. And um, I've been working with two of them. Michelle Robinson, you're going to be interviewing. She's amazing um, for maybe three or four years now. And another guy called uh, Robert Acute Samporna, and he's wonderful as well. So I've been doing this a long time in short. And then Michelle had gifted me the session with Tabash. So oh, it's wow. linking in uh, initially because I had not heard about Tabash. Uh, and since then, you know, he's just been spectacular for me. And so is Blair. It was a recognition. You know, like you, Tabash said you were one of his sons. Mm -hmm. Well, there's some connection with Tabash Blair and me that we remember. Anyway, back to the core fears. So the three core fears are the first one is I'm not good enough or I'm not worth loving. And a lot of little girls tell themselves they're not worth loving. And a lot of little boys get I'm not good enough. And what I've come to learn is that we are all toddlers pretty much walking around in grown up bodies. Mm -hmm. And the toddler story runs our lives, basically. And when you have someone between zero to five, it's really important, Trey, that you say to her, you are so worth loving. Not just I love you, those are important, but to say you are so worth loving and you are so good enough. And if your children are older than seven, then have conversations with them about these core fears. I think I know there's a video somewhere on my YouTube channel, Amanda Gore TV, that, that talks about the core fears. And, and when you've got zero to five, you can help them by reinforcing the antithesis of the fears. If they're over that, if you have out loud conversations with them, it's extraordinary how people remember or, or instantly relate to which core fear runs them. So first one, I'm not good enough. I'm not worth loving. The second is I'm uh, unsafe in some way which is very common if you have alcoholic parents or mentally unwell parents. Um, and I got the trifecta. And then the third one is separation, which initially I started off just saying, well, that's I don't belong, I don't fit in, because people could relate. But now I find I'm weaving in much more of the spiritual stuff about this is the separation that happens the second we're born, basically, and most of us forget and so our life's journey is back to the becoming one with ourselves and everything else. So of those core fears, because I had the trifecta, I, I enhanced mine, of course, because I had to be better. And so I didn't tell myself I just wasn't worth loving. I told myself I was worthless. Wow. And it took working with David to discover that, who also has extraordinary abilities. Uh, and then I told myself because my mum had left for a year when I was two, I told myself I was responsible for my mother's leaving. Because remember these stories, the toddler, a parent doesn't have to tell the child something. It can come from a, a, a sibling, a cousin, a teacher. It can come from anywhere, but it's the toddler's perception of what's just happened. And there are some studies that show, you know, if a baby's crying in a room and the parents are three rooms away and they don't hear anything, the toddler will tell itself they're abandoned. And so you, it's, it's not, it, you can't blame yourself externally for a toddler telling themselves these sto stories unless you know what the stories are. And then you can unembed the stories or retell the stories in a different way. But a toddler doesn't have the capacity, even at five, to, to uh, uh, you know, assess what's going on. 
they're pers- they're completely egocentric. So everything that happens is their fault. And that's why I said I was responsible for my mother's happiness, which I expanded into I was responsible for everybody else's happiness, mm-hmm. which I expanded into and I'm going to fix you. And that's why I have a history of shitty patterns in my life, in relationships, because I didn't even know I was doing it. So these last few years, of, uh, as I've grown as well, I've realised that I pushed myself to the, uh, to the extreme limit of everything because I was trying to prove I was good enough and prove I was worth loving and prove I wasn't worthless. And if you <clears throat> look at every pattern of behaviour, you will find one of the core fears. So it's what core fear, roughly when did it start, You don't have to dive in, but roughly when did it start? And then David gave me this question, who benefits? So if you, often people will quite quickly pick what story it was, if it's one. Otherwise, a lot of people got the trifecta, particularly high achievers. Um, And then two is roughly when did it start? And it's astonishing how most people remember I mean, I could ask you, Trey, but it's a bit personal to be on the podcast. And then the third thing is who benefits? And generally speaking, it's not you. Like I benefited in certain ways because it drove me to develop the skills I've developed to do what I'm doing at the level I'm doing it. But did it serve me in other areas where I was happy and in great relationships and all of that sort? No. Did it serve my parents? Yes. Because I was a little Miss Goody Two-Shoes. I was like perfect child and always there. And I looked after my mother till the day she died. I didn't know why. I just thought I loved her. So that was a very long and roundabout way of getting to um, uh, being more than more, as Tabash said, but working on the skills and learning about the spiritual nature of myself. I tell I'm a slow learner, really. I'm a little older than <laughs> most. Well, we're, I think we're always learning, right? Like we're always working on ourselves. That's like the the idea of evolution is to keep expanding our being, our, ourselves, that inner self, and keep continuing to grow. I think once you stop growing, that is death, right? Essentially. But I want to know, like, how is it that, you know, these teachers are bringing into your awareness these unconscious programs? And then how are they helping you kind of transcend those for yourself right is it just bringing awareness to those programs or is it like is it actual work or is there a modality like what does that look like everything i've tried almost i mean if i see a new thing whoa that sounds good because i started off in wellness and i morphed from wellness back in the day when wellness wasn't a word and i've morphed into stress excuse me and then what causes stress, so communication, connection, relationships, and communication in relationships. And now it's kind of come to a full circle of knowing yourself. And, and if, you, if you're speaking the corporate world, which I do, I can't be completely woo-woo. So I have to tie the woo-woo into the science and help them understand that the woo-woo is not really woo-woo. You know, it's it's really sure. the science. Yeah. And so in terms of epigenetics with the, you know, zero to seven, it's embedded. Um, w- when we're handling it, uh, I take them to emotional intelligence because the easiest definition of emotional intelligence is know yourself, manage yourself, and manage relationships. Sure. And know yourself is in the Bible. I don't know how many heaps of times. I'm not a biblical scholar by any stretch of the imagination. But it's at the essence, the core essence of everything. So the the presentations have kind of morphed into more and more, how do you know who you really are? So first of all, it's becoming an observer of your thinking. <clears throat> because the stories we're telling ourselves are just, in neuroscience, embedded loops. So we've got this reflex going on in that. And, you know, when you step on a nail... You don't stand there for three minutes going, oh, that's uncomfortable. Gosh, what could that be? You know, within a nanosecond, your foot's off the nail and um, you've reacted, your body's responded, you've balanced up, a million things have happened in a heartbeat. 
And so that's what happens with the stories. They've kicked in before we've even recognized it. And we've already acted in a reflex pattern. So the first part is to acknowledge, recognize, observe the stories you're telling yourself. And, and I'll say to people, your feelings are usually the, the key to the story you're telling yourself. Because if you start to feel rotten, then that's not normal for a human. Then it's time to go, oh, well, what's making me feel this way? What's the story I'm telling myself? And then because as toddlers we told ourselves the story, we can re we can undo the story. The younger you are, like your five-year-old, can be way easier for her. When you say to her, you are so worth loving, repeatedly, you are so good enough, um, uh, you are safe and that you belong. And whenever she has a little moment where she's connecting with wherever she came from, reinforce it. So you can you can help a lot when they're toddlers. Once you get past toddlerdom, it's still pretty easy in the early years after that. The teen years get harder. And then once you're an adult, the older you are, the more embedded these stories are. <clears throat> so, you know, last night, Trey, as, as late, I, I speak about this stuff. As late as last night, I'm having a session with Michelle because I do on a regular basis. It's like my business coaching. But my business coaching is about me because I know when I'm in a good state, my business is going better. And, you know, something else had happened, which was an experience, a relationship experience, not with a man, but with an, some friends. And it was another opportunity for me to dive again and realize that I was dealing with a yet even deeper layer of trying to do things because I my toddler believed it would make me more lovable. Mm. It would make these people like me more. So just last night, and I said to her, oh, man, I, I mean, this is like the four billionth time I've done this. So I think it's the layers. It's how deeply wounded you were at the time you told yourself the story. But I was unconscious of it. I thought that I had mostly dealt with that one because I've been working on it since I was 21. I knew about it since I was 21. And my work on it at the time was reading the books, Wayne Dyer, anybody that was there, going to seminars, working with people like Michelle and Paul and that sort of thing. And as I've aged and I've peeled away the layers, I, I notice I have to keep observing. So you asked for the tools. Well, observation is one of the biggest ones. And recognizing what David said to me one day, which he looked straight into my eyes and he said, you have lived 62 years of your life based on the story of a two-year-old. <laughs> Do you want to keep going? And I looked at her and I went, oh, no, no. And then started the really deep work. So observing understanding you've told yourself the story and that you can change it, catching yourself when you've already gone past the reflex go point and then stopping it. So you notice you've just reacted in a way that you really see as a pattern and you don't want to do it anymore. Actually, let, let me give you a diagram today because it, it might help in terms of the tools. So th the first is observation. And then think of concentric circles. So there's endless concentric circles. In the center circle is the essence of who you really are. And this was totally challenged, uh, channeled on stage one day. I hadn't even thought about this diagram and out came the diagram. So here's the essence of you, you, the, the innocent spirit that was born, that came to earth to have all these experiences, that selected its family, that well, asked for volunteers anyway, and people volunteered to be the dad, the mum, the whatever, so you could have this category of experiences. The next circle around the core circle, oh, this, this essence, by the way, it's like a brand new computer, and it's the state of the art. It's got everything, and it's running on source code, S-O-U-R-C-E, code. So the next layer, <coughs> excuse me, um, zero to seven, this is the time in epigenetics where we know we embed the messages, uh, the stories that we tell ourselves as toddlers. And I call the, the fears the malware. 
So the malware is inserted in the zero to seven time frame, and like malware does, it corrupts the source code. And then every other aspect of your life is run on the source code, uh, on the corrupted code, sorry, because while that corrupted code encases your essence, that's what your life is running on. And like malware in a computer, you don't even know it's in there to start with. But the malware gets in there and it starts multiplying and it makes little pus balls all over the computer, you know, it's like it's hidden in little corners. And, and it isn't until there's enough pus balls there that you start to notice glitches in your computer. And you go, whoa, that's odd, or gee, that's strange. And, and eventually they get bad enough that you think, oh, there's something wrong. Well, in our lives, that's the patterns. So if you looked at my life, my career has always been amazing. I, I'm astonished at how my career has gone. I just had this blessed journey the first time I came to America and it's not very common to have a foreign speaker be very popular in America, but I was. And honestly, I feel like I had nothing to do with it. I think that whole journey of my first 10 years here was super channeled and blessed uh, or orchestrated. But um, I, I had all of that happen in my career. But in my case, the patterns were relationships. So two marriages, couple of engagements, you know, I couldn't work out what it was. That I couldn't have good relationships and why they didn't last. And I would always assume it was me and I would, you know, be picking people who were lovely but not the right ones for me because the two-year-old was picking. So when you see patterns in your life, you'll start to get a clue as to what the malware is. And then the malware programs that you run observe your thinking or your story because again epigenetics teaches us 85 to 89 percent of the time we're literally unconscious of what we're thinking so we have to become conscious of it so how I, I kind of say it's the abc so a is aware not ai uh, as in artificial intelligence mm -hmm. but ai stands for awareness inside so be inside and observe what's going on the b stands for <clears throat> be present and if you're in the present, another thing apparently I never did until I met David, um, when you're in the present and you're brilliant at that, Trey, it's what makes you such a great interviewer, you're tuning into everything that's going on and you're not living in the past and you're not terrified about the future. You're right here right now and you're not in the story. As long as you're conscious and aware and observing any stories you are telling yourself. So, and be in your heart because your heart is where wisdom um, grows. Knowledge accumulates in the head, but wisdom grows in the heart. I haven't said that for ages. That was another one that was channeled on stage that I thought, wow, that's good. So you must be bringing stuff out, Trey. <laughs> um, and then the C is for conscious choices. So we're making choices all day, every day, but we're making them unconsciously. 95 to 99% of the time. So if you're conscious of the stories you're telling yourself, then you can slow down, as David says, to the speed of consciousness, and you can make a different choice sure. and not operate on that story. I love that. And I will always refer back to Plato's Allied Warrior of the Cave in this instance, where we are, you know, in his cave, these people are born shackled up, legs neck and they're facing a cave wall and behind them is a fire and the the, the handlers or the keepers are having these puppet shows you know, against the fire and it's displaying these shadows mm -hmm. and the prisoners think that that's the reality and to me um my interpretation i have many interpretations of the story but one can possibly be those are the programs that are running our our existence our reality and it's not until one of them become free of those chains of those programs and turns around and sees the fire behind them and realizes my entire reality has been an illusion. Like I thought that I was in control when actual programs from when I was a child are actually running the game. Like they're actually yeah. influencing all my decisions. And it's it can be an extent like an existential shock to someone when they realize that. I thought I was conscious of this. I am not. I am running off of fears from being a toddler, 
of not having that self-worth or being rejected or masculine mm -hmm. wounds or feminine wounds, like gender roles, all of those things influence our daily decisions. And it's all based off fear. And fear is an illusion in my interpretation, because um, when you free yourself from those chains and turn around and see what's been influencing your entire reality, now you have another decision. It is, uh, how do I how do I gain more awareness around what is actual reality and how can I change it? And Plato goes on and says, there are many things that you can do. Uh, one of them is uh, what he calls sophrosyne, which is temperance. It's it's no. putting in daily habits into your life that kind of keep you at 12, 12 o'clock. And it's not, you know, going to left or to the right uh, as far as, you know, getting sucked into the play and emotionally becoming attached to the results. Either it's all based off fear, essentially. And if you can do this and do other things like meditation, exercise, diet, all of these different things, you can become more aware in your body. And that's another thing too. A lot of spiritual uh, seekers kind of look at the body as just a bag of bones, like the avatar, right? And I feel like yeah. we as humans, right? Like we come here as spiritual beings. Yes. But we also have to recognize that we are human, human beings inside of a body and we have to honor that. And I feel yeah. like we are the bridge. The body is the bridge between heaven and earth. So we are mm -hmm. that marriage. And the more that we kind of, um, recognize that and treat this as our temple that is housing our essence, the more we can interact with the higher essence, the, the higher reality and gain more knowledge and, and, and inspiration to do the things that we truly want to do. Because I mean, ultimately, Amanda, look at the decisions in your and the choices in your life. What I'm hearing is that you made decisions that were based on externals, that were based on other people's thoughts and interpretations of what you should be doing and not necessarily the essence of what Amanda is. So when we turn inward and we go back within and remember who we truly are, we find something totally different than what we've been taught or programmed. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's just a perfect way of explaining it, Trey. And David had talked about Plato's allegory too. And it's just such a, it's such an apt description. And, and you summarized it really well. Because if you recognize pretty much everybody you interact with is a toddler walking around in a grown-up body that they may or may not have taken care of. And, and I'm all for taking care of the body, you know, starting off as a physical therapist and treating people who've been in pain. Part, part of the reason I started teaching a lot is because I knew people didn't have to be in pain. I, I could get people better when lots of others couldn't because I would tackle it in so many different ways. And I would teach them how to look after themselves, both mentally and emotionally and physically and and spiritually came in later I think I've always had it as part of the, my essence obviously but we all do however I I think the body as a temple concept is so important because if, if you feel dreadful you, you can't be conscious really sure. <laughs> you know, if you're wild, hung over because you drank yourself stupid the night before a bit of an extreme example but there's no way you can really be conscious. Yeah. Well, I think you can tap into that source code that you're talking about with intention, with um, protocols in your life. Like for instance, uh, going back to, uh, I have this book right here, uh, the hidden messages in water, right? Like we're 60 to 70% oh, yeah. of water, right? So the intention that you yeah. set directly affects the water uh, that was in that study. So if we're 60 to 70% water, the environment that we create for ourselves is directly influencing our our structure like our our the water that's in our body is a direct correlation to that so and there and water is also a great a great receiver of information so if you take yeah. care of yourself set positive intentions watch the environments the inputs the outputs of what you're doing to your body you can connect reconnect with that source code and you can receive information that is going to guide you at a higher level. Like right now, I am totally in the zone. I don't even know what I'm getting ready to say next. I'm just allowing the opportunity for that higher self, that source code to come through and speak to hear, who needs to hear this the most right now. And mm -hmm. when you do that on a daily basis, you start going within and you don't, you don't go outside of yourself to find the answers. We externally always search for the right book, the right teacher, the right message. 
when in actuality, we should be going in deeper into meditation and connecting with that source code. Because when we do that, we receive the information that we need in the moment that we need it. Absolutely. And for a lot of people, because I taught this 100 years ago too, um, meditation is so difficult. And, and I like to say to people, look, meditation can be gardening or swimming. You know, you get into a pool and just do laps. That very quickly becomes a, a mindful meditation. In fact, that reminds me, I met Ellen Langer once and she wrote a book called Mindful. She was the original mindfulness woman scientist. She's a spectacular human being. She's just, I can't even begin to describe her. She's such a an outrageous, outspoken, wonderfully herself anomaly. And uh, she talked a lot. I would think reading her books on mindfulness, even though that's going outside, as you go there and you you gather that knowledge, which you turn into wisdom with your experience as you integrate it, those sorts of things can help you too. And, you know, Trey, I, I knew about meditation. I've done Qigong, I did Qigong for seven years, became a Qigong teacher um, or trainer. I mean, name most of this. I did yoga for years, all of those things. But I think I'm a test case for the um, hardest nuts to crack so that if I've had to go through it, then I can give other people opportunities, different ways of doing it. Because for some people, it's really easy to meditate. For others, it's not. And the first time I ever went to learn meditation was TM. It was in Sydney with Ron, the, the man who mentored me into speaking. And I didn't know what it was. I had no meditation for it. did a bit of yoga. but So I sat down and we were in this dodgy house with this tiny little black and white TV about the size of the Zoom screen and um, this long-haired kind of fluffy-looking guy um, talking about Maharishi, whatever his name is. And so we had to watch this grainy, terrible video of Maharishi and then the guy says, okay, well, let's try it. So uh, uh, from what I remember, there was kind of no instruction, but I went, okay, then. So I shut my eyes. Oh, my stars, Trey. I had the one experience I've been hanging to have again for the whole of my life. I went out into, uh, I still can't explain it properly, uh, the, the vastness of everything, and it was like, like deep, deep, royal blue illuminated velvet. So it was like it was this velvety stuff with millions of little LED pinprick lights in it. And it was it was bliss. And and I just went, wow, this is so great. And I felt like I just got there when out of the ethos I hear, well, come on back now. And I go, no, no, no. And that experience has sustained me for a lot of my life. And I've, I meditated forever trying to get it back again. But of mm. course, you can't take trying to get something. However, I didn't know that at the time. Mm -hmm. So me meditation is one of the strategies. But, but honestly, I, I think one of the biggest, and it doesn't sound like it's a, well, here's step one and it's easy and step two. Observing your thinking is a key because remember most of the fears kick in as a reflex. So you don't even know they've come in. I was fixing people and they would say, you're fixing me. And I go, no, I'm not. I, you, you end up with this complete blank and inability to see what you're actually doing. So that observing is such a big part of the step and acknowledging so actually going inside to your point, and as we say the three core fears, I'm not good enough, I'm not worth loving, I'm unsafe in some way, I'm separate, I don't belong, I don't fit in. Which one resonates with you? And then spend some time actively exploring. It's kind of like I read a book called Glittering Images once, a novel, but there was a, 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 fray, a, a paragraph in it that has stayed with me forever. It's about this guy's a monk and... Uh, he falls in love with a woman 
And he goes to talk to another monk about falling in love with this woman and what he should do. And and the other monk is counselling him. And at the end of it, this monk decides to leave, go be with the woman he loves, and he's thanking the other guy. And the other guy says, I didn't do anything. I just shone a light on the dark parts of your soul so you could decide what to do. Mm. And, and this awareness is a bit like shining a light on those fears and the ability to observe them and uh, challenge them and then reassure that small child. You know, if anybody's listening to this and they're thinking, and the reason I'm cutting in like this is because there will be somebody listening that's thinking like this because they are. Um, I just got that. I used to say, oh, not the little child again. It's everything as a result of the inner child. Do we have anything in life without the inner child? Because I had people telling me to look at it, but I strongly resisted. I have now come to terms with the fact that pretty much is the toddler inside. And how much have we grown so that we can accept this and then tell the toddler it's okay for them to be a toddler? You can go out and play now. I'm a grown-up. I've got this. And then remember with the malware, if we if we get rid of the big pus ball of malware, there's still the little pieces that are in there. So here I am dealing still at 69 with the last little, I hope, pus ball pieces around the core fears. You know, yes, I'm still going to learn, but I'm... I'm hopeful I am going to learn without those core fears being anywhere except integrated into the past. Sure. I love all of that. I love all of that. I just, I'm so fascinated with your meditation experience, like um, not to take away from everything you just said, but I want to know, like, was that getting shot out of your body? Like, were you in the cosmos? Like, do you recognize it as that? You do ask great questions. I've wondered very often what it was. And the the own the word that just came then is it was the void. But it isn't it's not an empty void. So so park that image because I had that image and it was the void, but it was this rich, deep, deep silence. And, and a sense of bliss. Another time, which I've forgotten all about till this second, I was given some kind of image where, you know when you go to fairs, state fairs and things, and they have people who blow bubbles, and there are some people who blow a really big bubble, you know, like giant bubbles, and they're all wobbly and they've got rainbows in them. Well, the image I was given is that when we're with the soul groups, I guess, there's all these giant bubbles blah, 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 along and they merge into each other and then they emerge again so that we're, we are part of everything but we're still uh, separate in some way. But it's not a, there's no word to describe sure. it. Maybe individual isn't right, separate isn't right, but we can merge and unmerge. Sure. So way. you felt like Amanda when you were merged with the void. <clears throat> I don't know. I just felt fabulous. And I didn't have any experience of shooting out somewhere or uh, going on a trip or in a rocket or anything. I would just, I shut my eyes and what seemed like two seconds later, I'm out there going, wow. <laughs> so you still had I your awareness, be, right? Like you had I any awareness. Have. Yeah. 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 Because I've had similar I, experiences where I'm dreaming and um, I am the observer, right? Like it wasn't bliss, but it was like, I am totally observing something outside of myself. And I am, I don't, it's not that I don't feel like Trey. It's just, I'm like this awareness. Like it's not even attached to a body. It's just kind of like, I'm, I'm watching something from that like camera perspective of an event happening in my dream. And then I wake up and I'm like, Oh, that, what was that? Right. Cause I didn't have a body. I didn't have any type of uh, persona attached to that. I was just the observer. I was just the witness. I was yeah. just the, the camera. And so when I hear stories of 
people having this uh, like kind of similar to your story of being in the void, there is this sense of awareness. There isn't necessarily a persona attached to that, but it's just kind of like you're just observing whatever it is that you're observing. And then um, how did you integrate that back into your life? You just kept going after that, like trying to grasp onto that, like that feeling and searching for things that would get you back there. Well, two, two things. Firstly, I think as you were speaking, when I was in the void, for want of a better phrase, my my sparkly illuminated velvet, it's interesting. I've never thought about this. Now. I was observer and experiencing. So I could feel the bliss and it was just like, wow. Oh. Uh, but at, at the same time, I could observe it. Oh, it's it's like the the bubbles going in and out. Sure. And when I came back, I really didn't want to come back. And then they taught us the technique. And it never worked for me again. You know, I, I could, and then I tried all sorts of other meditation. I used to teach meditation techniques, but I could never get it back again. And then I realized, took a long time that, you know, when you you're meditating with a goal, like you want to achieve that specific thing, highly unlikely to happen. So you were going me. in with, yeah, you were going in with beginner's mind of like, I have no expectation whatsoever. And then boom, you oh. have this transcendent experience. And then now it's yeah. like, oh, I, I want that. I want to feel that again. Like, let's yeah. go people, let's go. And that's, again, having a goal in my, same thing with me. I feel like it's a cosmic joke. It's like the more that you try to have an experience, the more that you won't have that experience. It's like, yep. you know what I mean? It's that human mind of like, I need to have, I have this goal. I'm going to, you know, X, Y, Z, get there in a linear fashion. I'm going to set up, I'm going to get up at this time. I'm going to drink this water. I'm going to, you know, prepare myself the best that I can before I go to bed. I'm going to read this passage. I'm going to do this. I'm going to pray. I'm going to have my crucifix. I'm going to do this. <laughs> and I, Guess what, guys? I'm going to heaven. <laughs> And yeah. I'm going to experience that bliss. And it's like, no, and, not how it works. Ha, 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 ha. Do you, a friend of mine sent me the other day. I wish I could find it now and I'll play it. But it's a YouTube clip. And it's our spirit guides watching us go through life. And there's two guys up in the clouds, hysterical with laughter. They're just like bending over, doubled up, shrieking, tears running down their faces. And it was so appropriate. Because I think they must look down and just be laughing their asses off, sure. watching us fumble laugh, our way through. Laugh now, buddy, because when it's my turn to be your spirit guide, guess what? Watch out. <laughs> you're gonna, it all, yeah, you're it gonna all comes suffer. around, pal. Suck it up, princess. <laughs> <laughs> um, Actually, you did trick. Can I say something else that you just triggered yeah. as you were talking? Uh, David and his wife, Kim, had come up with this concept, which I've now modified a little bit. But in terms of a technique, it's uh, think of three prongs. So there's one in the middle and one either side. This side represents the story you're telling yourself and the degree to which you're telling yourself the story and operating from it. And this side is the emotion that the story triggers. You know, so I'm not worth loving. And if it's just a little bit, well, you know, I'm dealing with life okay. But then something tragic happens, some interaction with someone else, and it doesn't have to be romantic, it's anything where you've been trying really hard to do something and it's backfired, now you've got the extremes, you're really emotional about it, then this tool is a way of checking yourself. Because as the emotion increases in intensity, you are more and more hooked into the story. So when you notice high intensity or um, even medium intensity feelings or kind of any feelings that are negative, instantly think about, oh, wait a minute, which story is it? And then bring yourself back to the present because in the present is equanimity. It's that kind of center, inner peace type thing. And this is the observer position, if you like, in the present. It's the experiencer, you're the antenna, you're the receiver. Um, all of these things are happening in the present and everything's available to you. Mind you. I'm saying this, I'm still working on it myself. Anyway, <laughs> everything's available to you here. And if you recognize that, you go, oh, wait, I'm in my story, back to the present. Right here, right now, is the toddler alive and well? Yes, they're safe. 
uh, tell the toddler they're alive and well, and let's come back to being an adult. And as an adult in this position, going internally with all those things that you just said and deciding what's right for the adult in this position and what is really going on around me with the ability of the adult, an aware adult, to perceive, mm. not the perception through the glasses of fear. Sure. Then oh, you get on got top. Some, got some hearts coming out. I've never seen that before. Are you serious? Yeah, there were some parts of the I thing. did. I've never seen that before either. Wow. <laughs> you really get to do that? I, you I, did. I didn't do that. Amanda, you got seriously? hearts. Yeah, seriously. I didn't do that. Wow. That was, I don't know wow. what that was. Maybe, uh, yeah, you're resonating. You're receive, You're letting out love right now, right? God is love. You're giving yeah. that out to people and letting them listen to this. Um, but going back to your story, I just want to really hit on this part of it. So you go into meditation, no expectations, you experience the void, which in my opinion is the source code, right? Yeah. You went within yourself to experience that. That's where it's at. And how do we know the God, the source code within, right? It's having these experiences, but if you're grasping for the straw, it's always going to be elusive. It's like you just, what you do essentially, your responsibility as a human being is to set the conditions for these experiences. And as you work towards that, then yeah. God's grace comes in. And that's when you receive guidance. I feel like we're always receiving little nuggets, little carrots, and you don't, it's not up to you when you get it, right? I feel like it's, you set, your responsibility is to only set the condition for it. And you continue, it's okay. Spirituality is not all love and light, guys. I, I, I really don't want to burst anybody's bubble. It is, yeah. it is hard. hard work. It is hard work. <laughs> It is dark and light. It is, you are essentially growing when you are in the dark, when you are in mm -hmm. your crap, like when you are in that moment of questioning everything in your reality, the existential shocks, that is when growth happens. And then you come yeah. back into the light. And guess what? You're going back into the darkness at some point, And it's just a game of polarity. It's a game of growth. It is that is evolution of consciousness. We have been spoiled by this false idea of comfort. That's what we essentially yeah. try to worship is comfort. That's what, sorry for those who are very religious, but in my opinion, dogma is comfort. If you want to have someone tell you what to do, what to study, how to, yeah. how to worship, you go to church. If you want to be a spiritual seeker, then you take it upon yourself take the responsibility and do the work for yourself. Mm, absolutely, 100%. And and I think people do feel that it's it gets hard and then they give up. They think, oh, well, that can't be right. T two things came out of that, Trey. One is the only thing I've ever known that I've known, that I've known that I've known that I've known, known, and, and I've tried very hard to know other things as well, and, and I've worked at it, but this one I just knew, is that before we come to earth, we have, you know, our soul group is in this little posse and uh, you, me, we, we put our hands up and go, ah, I think I'm ready to go down to earth again. And this time I want to learn this and this and this. And this time I want to focus in on those core fears. Um, and I need an alcoholic father. Anybody willing? Mm -hmm. And, you know, my dad put his hand up. And then mum put a hand up and my sister and brother and and so on. And then we come into earth and, of course, blank, most of us, not all of us, but most of us go blank. And then we spend the rest of our life looking outward, blaming, making excuses, saying it's someone else's fault. Well, sadly, I never had that because I always knew that we kind of signed a contract so I've said, I can't tell you how many times in my life I've said, what was I thinking when I signed that? What is the matter with me? And it, it's interesting because it puts a completely different context around everything that happens to you because we preordained what we would like to experience. So then others and we set up circumstances in which we can have the experiences that we want to have. And if we'd learned that lesson, 
then awesome, we can go on to another one. But if you don't learn it in that experience, you get that experience times 10 and maybe times 100 and so on until finally it's the, you know, four by two in the head and you go, oh, oh, yeah, okay then. Mm -hmm. Then you can move on to the next thing. So, so that's the first one. And the second one is when I was living in Vermont writing the book, I, I'd been told to write a book on joy forever, ages, years, three or four years. And I hadn't had trouble writing books before, but this one I could not write. So we were living in Vermont and my mum had just died. And this was prior to me doing all the work and I was devastated. So I woke up one morning and I had this kind of dream, not dream thing where mum came and she said, look, we'll put together a writing committee. You just go downstairs and meditate. We'll download the information and then you go write it. Um, I wasn't. I had not had too many experiences like that. So I'm like, whoa, yeah, all right then. Mm -hmm. Nothing else is left. I'll give it a try. And so I sat down, I meditated for 20 minutes, and I went to the computer and I wrote about, I don't know, three or four chapters in a, like one row, no preparation, <laughs> no notes, no nothing. It just came out. And the book was done in about five weeks, wow. which I found as astonishing and and then tying into that is that you know I was I thought I was the most joyless person I knew seriously and I'm writing a book on joy and I felt such a fraud which is probably why it had to be channeled because I could not have done it and the the steps in the book give you all the steps to basically reframe life so that you can transform something from absolute misery into some kind of uh, joyful flavored experience, and joy doesn't mean that you've got to be bouncing around like, Oh, life's great. Mostly, joy is in a piece, mostly, joy is the bliss void experience that sense of complete peace. And I, I didn't know the end chapter of the book was going to be called equanimity, which I had to change because nobody knew what equanimity meant. Um, so I had to change it to inner peace, but the reason that chapter is twice the length of the other chapters I realized ages afterwards is because it incorporates all the others. You go through all the other 11 steps to get to the 12th step, which is the, the inner peace. Mm -hmm. And then the, the third thing that came out of what you were just saying, one day I was in Vermont again, I think, and I was fed up with, oh, what am I doing? What's my purpose? Blah, 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 again. And, and I kind of yelled out, what's my purpose? And I heard really clearly eradicate fear. Yeah. I said, what? Oh, whoa. And the human part of me is going, oh, I shouldn't have asked. And then another part of me is going, oh, no small feet. All right, just eradicate fear. All right then. And I was talking to somebody about it afterwards, a friend who was into these things, and I said, and I heard eliminate fear. Boy, as soon as I'd finished that R of the fear, I heard this, we said eradicate, not eliminate. And I mean, it wasn't that violent, or but it sounded loud to me. And I had to go and look up the difference between eradicate and eliminate because I didn't know. Uh, do you know, Trey? No idea. Well, the, uh, when you eliminate polio, you eliminate the cases of polio. When you eradicate polio, you eradicate the virus. Oh. So when they say eradicate fear, it's like, oh, yeah, all right then. Just this lifetime, is it? <laughs> that just the purpose for this month? So did you hear so, that voice in Audible or was it like a mind thought kind of transmission? Oh, I'd say, who asked the best question? I'd say a mind transition, but I heard it. You know, it was... It's really sure. interesting. I, I don't know how to describe it because I, it's only happened maybe five, six, seven times in my life. Sure. And, and it's like a booming. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, like, listen, like if you ask yourself the, your question, right, like get into a, a calm state of mind, right? Like that equ equanimity, you get into that 12 o'clock position and you ask the question, what is my purpose immediately? And everyone can try this wherever you're at immediately you'll get an answer and people doubt that answer they don't know what where it's coming from 
It can trigger those programs that you're talking about. It could be too big for us, which triggers fear, you know, like yeah. eradicate fear that automatically there's a resistance to that because there's a, there is one, you don't understand what eradicate is, right? Like, so what does that mean? Like, do I eliminate fear? But then there's those doubts of like, who am I to eradicate fear? Like, why am Absolutely. I the person to do that? Like, who makes, who makes me qualified? I guess I got to go back to college and get a master's degree and can counseling or something so I can eat, eradicate fear, or I got to go do this and that before I even become qualified to do this thing or pursue this thing. In actuality, you are already qualified because of the person and the being and the life that you have lived, because people will connect with that story, with that energy, with that vibration. And you will be the person that, that had been, you know, you will become that person. And that's, that's another, that's another part of the equation. It's like, you have to become that. And I didn't understand what that meant mm. when you have to become the, the version of yourself in order to collapse that potentiality of the reality that you want to create. I didn't know what that meant. I thought, oh, well, if I can imagine it and just feel it, right? Like, oh, that's me yeah. becoming it. No, you have to walk around with that swagger of the person that you want to be and be that individual and set the boundaries that you want to set in your life and not allow that negativity to creep in and, and chirp and say, you can't do it because you're not worthy. You have to be the person that you want to become in and out. And that's what alchemy is truly about. That is mm. taking... That is what it's turning, you know, alchemy, you're turning that in whatever that copper is or whatever that, whatever that metal is that you're, you're turning into gold. When you become it, that's the prize. That is the, the process. That is, that is it. And that was so beautifully said. And I can guarantee there's a whole lot of people listening that are saying, well, yeah, that sounds easy. And and how what are the steps that you took, Trey, to actually become that? Because it's true, and I'm still working at the. Oh, let me t let me turn it a little bit. So in terms of the eradicating fear, I was overwhelmed when I realised what it was, and I thought, well, how am I ever going to do that? Well, of course, I had to start with myself and work through it. And I've only just realised, probably in the last couple of weeks that as I start a podcast, which again, I was a bit reluctant to do, but I've I've had too many incoming sure. messages. Um, and um, But mine isn't so much interviewing too many others, I think, at this stage. I'm not sure I'm allowing. I think allowing is a very, very big word and yeah. accepting, as I've been reading more of Paul Selig's work as well. So I'm... I'm I'm focusing on being present and aware of everything that's going on to the best of my conscious ability and to allow things to come to me because I do know all of us have many options in a present moment, but few of us have the capacity to slow down to the speed of consciousness, as David says, to be aware of it and then to make a wise decision. Sure. I personally Does use, I use yeah, what you're saying? yeah. I personally use a method called quantum jumping, which is uh, going into meditation and then envisioning what I interpret to be the highest version of myself in that position, in that uh, reality, and then I have a conversation with it, right, or that that version mm -hmm. of me, and then I will get receive information that I it's not coming from my mind. But it's what I need to hear in that moment. And I take that and I integrate it into who I am right now. And then I become that, right? What is the best version of trade look like when I am the best speaker, right? when I'm the best motivational speaker, when I'm the best podcaster, and I envision it in my mind and I play with my imagination. And then when in my reality, I become that, whatever that looks like. I don't just talk about it. I walk the walk. Mm -hmm. I act like it. I behave like it. I have the mindset of that. And then your reality starts to shift and you mm -hmm. start attracting different people into your life, different opportunities into your life. I have just started doing that for myself where it's not easy, but when you start having those doubts, those are the programs. And that's when you stay at 12. That's when you stay in that centered space and you just, you realize that it's not, it's the fear of being that, that is triggering those thoughts. 
And so continue to walk that path of being the best version of yourself, being the person that you want to become, being whatever that goal is, walk it. And when people try to tell you that you're not it, ignore them, ignore them, because you will start putting out different vibrations, different frequencies into the quantum realms that will attract opportunities, attract people into your life that will give you the opportunity to be that version of yourself. And mm. don't worry about failure. That is fear, right? You will, because <laughs> everyone experiences reality differently. People will hear mm. this conversation differently. You're you're experiencing this relation or this this relationship in this conversation totally different than what I'm experiencing it. So you go in with the confidence of like, if I mess up, somebody's might not hear that, right? They might hear something totally different. But I'm going to go in with the trust and the faith that the universe is giving me these messages for a reason and that I'm going to speak my truth and whatever comes out, comes out. I'm just allowing, I'm just being a conduit. I am just showing up and I'm setting the conditions for something great to come through me. And that's it, right? And that's all you can, that's all nice. you can do. That's your responsibility. Yeah. Well, certainly setting the conditions. And I, I think speak your truth that you mentioned that's very confusing for a lot of people, Trey, because they haven't done as much practice as you and they haven't, because it's obvious the amount you read and the work that you do, you are a, a real student and you are certainly on a rapid growth path and the way you're approaching the speaking career and things like that. To speak your truth, for a lot of people, it takes time to get to their truth. Sure. So the concept of meditating and going to their higher selves, which is I, brilliant. I'm going to try it. I haven't heard of that before. And I'm not, I'm not confident I will find it so easy to start off with because of my past experiences, but I'm willing to try it and allow the experience to unfold. In terms of speaking my truth, it's been, it's been a really interesting thing because I kind of know my truth. There are times when I do know my truth, but then the fear of speaking my truth holds me back because of, um, you know, I was very blessed with my mother in some ways because we never worried about what other people thought and for what, fear of what others think, is endemic in the world and it's one of the biggest fears. It's rooted in all the others, but in those three core fears. But I, I, I don't really worry about what other people think but it's my own fears that have stopped me speaking my truth because that means other people wouldn't like me mm -hmm. or I wouldn't be worth loving or I wouldn't be good enough. And, and so it's just an interesting perspective of your truth because what's your truth is not necessarily anybody else's truth. It's just as valid and it's for you as long as it comes clearly through and it's not filtered through the fears. 100%. Amanda, I could talk to you for years. Um, how, can people, first, right? how can people find you? How can they connect? How can they buy the book? Uh, my website, amandagore.com. If they want to see some of the videos and share it with their children, it's Amanda Gore TV on YouTube. And then I, I have Instagram, although I have yet to master Instagram. Mel does that for me, my VP of everything. Um, and I've got a Facebook channel and I will start writing some blogs and newsletters again soon. You can sign up for the newsletter. I've been a bit slack lately. But Trey, I'm so grateful for the opportunity and for Tabash for introducing us. Absolutely. My pops from three lives ago introducing us uh, and having this miraculous yeah. conversation. Amanda, this has been amazing. This You have been a beautiful conduit of spirit, of higher intelligence. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. And by the way, wasn't that heart thing weird? Do you promise you didn't do that? I promise. I promise. That's the weirdest thing. Oh, wow. Talk about confirmation. I don't know what it's confirming, but it was spectacular. Spectacular.